Welcome back. It's Dr. Trevor from Physics This Week, and we're going to continue talking about coupled oscillators, and I want to show you a few things uh, in particular about these. Uh, by the end of this, you should be able to set up and analyze a, the complete system of two masses in three springs, and then you're going to learn how to determine the eigenfrequencies of the coupled system and the eigenfunctions of the coupled system. I don't expect you to know what these guys are quite yet, but let's take a look and let me show you what they are. In the previous video, I showed you how we look at the stretches in the springs. We measure the positions from uh, the equilibrium point on the oscillators, and we remember that it's the change in length of the spring is what's important. We measure this from the equilibrium positions of each of the slides. The individual forces never change directions, but the net forces do. And we found out that the equations of motions of each of these guys uh, was a combination of a little bit of the x1 and a little bit of the x2 in somewhat of a symmetric bit where the 2k and the k change places with the x1 and the x2. Now if we take a look more closely at the equations of motion for this, remember a is just the second derivative with respect to position, uh, the second derivative of the position with respect to time, and it kind of looks like if we divide both sides by m, we've got this k over m thing going on, which in the past we called an omega squared, but because there's three springs here and there's two variables that we've got, x1 and x2, we don't want to quite do that. But we want to take a look at what the motion looks like. And I showed you a graph of this before. Notice there is a little bit of oscillatory things going on here. It's just that the amplitudes are fairly strange. So let's try the usual oscillatory function. And if we take the derivatives of this with respect to time, we get these guys. And note that I have written it in this form because it's easier to take the derivatives. But these two forms are equivalent as long as you have the right a's and phi's. At the end of the show, I'm going to change back to this form because oftentimes it's easier to see the motion in this form than it is in this uh, exponential form, especially because that we've got some uh, imaginary bits going on here. We can do the same thing with the uh, x2, work our way down through. So x1 and x2 are acting as our characteristic equations, and we're going to go through a similar process that we did before. So if we take those derivatives and put them back into the equations of motion, notice that just like in the past, the characteristic equation, bits of it are going to cancel out. The a1s don't cancel out, the a2s can't cancel out, but this uh, exponential bit does, and then we can perform a little bit of algebra on it to set it equal to zero. We do the same thing with the other equation of motion. And again, the uh, exponential parts drop out and we rearrange a little bit. And then we do a final bit of rearrangement so that we've got the A1s first, the a 2 second. Now we have a system of two linear equations. We're going to apply a little bit of linear algebra to them. I've just rewritten them down here. And we're going to put this into a matrix form where these guys are the bits that go with the A1 and then the A2. And then I've done the same thing uh, on the bottom here. OK, the reason I've gone to this uh, matrix form is this is a more compact way to write uh, this series of two linear equations. You may not have taken linear algebra quite yet, but I kind of want to give you a taste of what it's going to look like when you actually get there. Now, it turns out that with this type of an equation, in order to have a generic solution, the determinant must be equal to 0. Now, the determinant is just this guy out front. We're going to set it equal to 0. We write the brackets around it to show that we're talking about the determinant. And for a generic a matrix, it turns out that if you take from E to H and then you take from G to F, you get this type of a form for it. So that the determinant for this particular equation is given by this guy. 
Now you've seen this type of process before when you've done cross products. Uh, it will come back again, uh, again in linear algebra, and it will also come back into play in quantum mechanics. You'll use it quite a bit. So I want to give you a foretaste of uh, what's coming down the pike. Okay, if I expand the squares here, do quite a bit of algebra, and all of this stuff is trying to get this broken down so I can figure out what values omega actually has. Now, to be honest, once you get this into standard form, this guy, it might be easier to just apply the quadratic equation rather than try to factor it. Uh, the quadratic equation always works, only in nice cases like this particular one will the, uh, the factoring work. But if you remember from algebra, we've factored this into two terms. In order for this to be zero, one or the other or both of the terms have to be equal to zero. So we set the first term equal to zero or the second term equal to zero. We can do a little bit of solving there or we can solve the other one. And notice that we get two frequencies that differ by the square root of three. Now this was something that was kind of suspected because we had the two variables, but uh, it's a good thing that we found it out because we actually have two solutions to this system of equations uh, rather than just one. But you know that because anytime you have a quadratic equation, the same type of thing uh, happens. Okay, if we go back to the matrix and we take it back into the individual bits. And the way the matrix works is I take this first term times A1 and then the second term times the A2 and I set it equal to either the top or the bottom here. And I can do that for both of these guys. Uh, so this one I went across the top and down. The second equation I went across the bottom and down uh, to get those guys. So if I did a little bit of algebra I can find out that the relationship between A1 and A2 is actually that they're equal to each other. Or, using the second equation, it turns out with a little bit of algebra that A1 can equal negative A2. So again, we've got two solutions. We had two equations. We essentially had four unknowns, x1, x2, um, omega 1 and or omega-3, and A1 and A2 were the amplitudes of the oscillations, omega-1 and omega-3 were the angular frequencies of the oscillation equations, and we could have done any combination here uh, with omegas uh, into the equations. Um, as long as we're consistent and we work it through, there are four sets of solutions that will work here, and it doesn't matter which combination we use, we either find out that A1 is equal to A2 or A1 is equal to the negative of A2. Now if we put everything back together, we started out with this guy, and now I'm going to change it to cosine uh, omega t uh, plus phi, showing my phase angle, because here I can actually look at this, and just uh, from previous practice, I know that this is an oscillatory function, and I don't have to carry around that uh, nasty imaginary number that's there. I get the same thing for x2. We can mix a1 and omega-3 and a2 and the plus sign and the minus sign. Um, because we started out with all of the masses being the same and all of the spring constants being the same. If that were not the case, then we would have to be a lot more careful with this system. Since x1 and x2 are related by this plus and minus sign, let's add and subtract them. If I do q, q plus is equal to the sum of the two, and then I plot out the individual bits. So I want to plot x1 plus x2. Suddenly I've got a oscillatory motion that's very regular. It's not as choppy as these guys are. If I do the same with the subtraction of the two, I again get a second set of oscillations that is very nice and regular in there. Q1 and Q2 we call the eigenfunctions of this system, and depending on which textbook you're using, uh, you may have called it the normal modes, or you may hear people call it the normal modes. 
and omega-1 and omega-3 are the eigenfrequencies of the system. If you take a close look here, and if you actually fit these guys, you would find out that these two frequencies of the eigenfunctions actually differ by the square root of 3, which is a pretty interesting result. And it happens for any set of coupled oscillators in which you've got K1, K2, K3 all equal to each other, and M1 and M2 equal to each other. But it also occurs in all kinds of coupled oscillation or, or coupled oscillator systems. Now let's compare these eigenfunctions to unit vectors. In the past, you had vectors uh, that you looked at the resultant that was made up of a vector in the x direction and a vector in the y direction, and you broke that into uh, components by using the unit vectors, uh, x and y hats on each of those. In this particular system, these guys are acting as eigenfunctions, and we add them together in different amounts to get back to these guys. So the eigenfunctions are fundamental to the system and its physical setup. The actual motion will depend on how much of each of these two functions that you have uh, added together. So I've kind of shown this as uh, A plus and A minus. Um, being the relative amount of Q1 and the relative amount of Q2 that's added into the system. Just like you've got unit vectors, you've got unit functions that are going on here. Although we call the unit functions eigenfunctions. So in a quick review of everything we've covered so far, the eigenfunctions or the normal modes are determined solely by the parts of the system. In our situation, it depended on the masses and the spring constants. If we have a system of two masses and three springs, it has two eigenfunctions and two eigenfrequencies. If K1, K2, and K3 are all equal to each other and M1 and M2 are equal to each other, then the frequencies of these eigenfunctions differ by the square root of three. The motion of the system is determined by the mixture of the eigenfunctions uh, or the normal modes. Hopefully this information has been helpful. I've got one more video to show you where we show different mixtures of these normal modes. Uh, so hopefully you'll stick around to see that. This has been Trevor from Physics This Week. See you soon.